All right, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure some more people will log in and trickle in to our classroom today. Thank you, thank you. Drew, taking good care of me, brought me some water. I'm hoping not to cough in all of your ears. Oh, it's it's being recorded. I know. Hey, I'm I'm no dummy. So, how is everybody today? Everybody good? Happy Friday. How's everybody there on Zoom? Everybody good? Awesome. Super. So, remember for those of you that are home on Zoom, if you have a question, just unmute yourself. I'm not likely to see the chat. Um, oops. And we... Um, Can I not get him on the chat for you? That would be fantastic. Thank you, yep. Shane. Yes, ma'am. Um, so if you if you can't unmute and you need to put something in the chat or it's not um, urgent for an interruption, you want to put the question in, Shane will help us. I love that. Thank you for being here. Um, so I want to go ahead and start off with the question. How many of you know that there are farm changes coming November or, or um, January 1st? Everybody? Okay, good. How many of you have seen um, internet discussion on forms changes for January 1st? Anybody? Nobody seen anything on the internet? Oh, Dimitar has. Okay. Nobody else? Well, there's been some, there's been some discussion about some of the changes. And um, so it was important to me as soon as these educational versions came out that we started to have a real discussion and you guys got to um, ask the source any questions that you have because I, I love the fact that I get to um, serve on the forms committee this year has been as vice chair next year I will be the chair of the committee so any questions comments concerns you guys have regarding our forms you can send them right to me okay um the document that I have up for you right now is the overview of all of the changes that are being released. So we are not going to go over every single document. I only put uh, four documents into the Google Drive because I want to go over the four that are really important. Okay, but these are all um, the documents that we have in a summary that you can look at. There will also be some more videos coming out from NVAR. I got to be a movie star yesterday and do some videos over at NVAR that they're gonna put out to the membership as well, okay? Um, so the first document that I wanna go over with everyone is gonna be the post-settlement occupancy agreement. We are just gonna dig in and get rid of the hard part first, okay? And I wanna grab my hard copy of this. It is easier for me to look at. So can everybody see the post-settlement occupancy up on the screen? No, at home, you guys don't have it? Okay. What's the matter? There are copies coming around of everything. Do you guys not have the post-settlement yet? All right. Yes. When they read about all the changes, yes. Um, are you going to send the classes remain or? That sheet is being printed. The one, the one that I just had that had the list of everything. Yep, you're getting a printout. Of. Yep. Um, so while you guys are getting the post settlement occupancy document in your hand, we can still go ahead and start because I do have it up on the screen. So can you, you guys at home, can see that now that I reshared? Okay, awesome. All right, so post-settlement occupancy agreement. This is one of the most difficult um, documents, situations, what have you, that we have in our form library. And the Forms Committee spent hours and hours and hours on trying to make this better and clearer for our members and for our clients. Um, this even went to the attorney roundtable. So just to give you guys a little insight to how the forms committee works, 
we talk about different topics that are coming up and suggestions that come from the membership within the committee. But when there's a big item that we need legal advice on, we actually send it to the attorney roundtable so that they can, in their committee, vet what it is that we're trying to do as well. So that we have, and we have attorneys on our committee, but that attorney roundtable then goes and looks at everything as well and gives us feedback on what they think, you know, any unintended consequences are. Um, so everything really goes through the ringer um, when we're going to roll it out for you guys. Okay. So the first thing that I want to make very clear is that this document is not an, um, an addendum to the contract. Okay. It is not an addendum to the contract. It is an agreement that is a standalone agreement that survives settlement, okay? And there are some different things that we're going to talk about in this document that will, uh, you'll understand why I have said that to start with, okay? So the name of the document is a post-settlement occupancy agreement, not addendum. And we moved the disclosure that the agreement is not a lease and is not subject to VRLTA, we move that right to the top in bold. Okay, we used to have that embedded in the paragraph language below. <clears throat> we do reference the contract because obviously you're not gonna have a post-settlement agreement if you didn't have a contract, right? So it's in conjunction with, it is not an addendum to. All right, does anybody have questions about that? Okay. Again, it's going to be very important on a couple of things that we talk about. So the first change in this document has to do with the occupancy charge. Does anybody know what is missing here? That's some of the packet. Yeah. Yeah, there should be five documents. Sorry. No, you're good. Anybody at, at home know what the three choices used to be? The twelve month, the twelve month total thingamajig, the last one that nobody ever selects. <laughs> yeah. So the PITI. Yep. And actually, when we weren't doing it for free, that was the most common one that was selected. Was for the settlement agent to calculate the buyer's costs per day for the time that they were in, and then that would be what the charge was to the seller for the time that they were occupying the property. So the reason that we got rid of it completely is the first part of it tied it to specified financing, okay? Where it said that it would be the PITI of the specified financing, which if you're familiar with the contract, it's what's on page one, right? Where it talks about the down payment and the type of loan, et cetera. Well, the buyer can unilaterally change they're financing at any time from when they're ratified to close without having consent from the seller. So when you have it tied to specified financing in the ratified contract and a buyer changes their financing, they no longer have specified financing protection in their contingency and the seller may have an adverse consequence to that because they went from putting 20% down to 10% down, right? So now, the, now it's more expensive for that daily rate because their mortgage is more expensive or they changed financing completely where they said, I'm gonna go conventional and then they switch it to FHA, right? So the payment may be different. So that causes a consequence to the seller. So we decided, you know what? We're just not gonna leave it um, to be so ambiguous. The other piece is who gets to decide what the PITI is then at closing, well, the settlement agent has to figure out what's going to be charged to the seller. Do they go back and try to figure out and calculate what it would have been at the um, offer price, or do they use the price of everything that comes in? It just, it was too messy. So it's gone. So we now have a flat fee per day, or so a per diem, or a total flat fee for the entire period of time. Okay. All buyers have been talking, should have been talking, whatever, to a lender prior to submitting an offer, right? We're including pre-approval letters with our offers. An agent can speak to the lender and get an approximate 
per diem on what the cost is to the buyer before the offer is made, right? They're doing um, good faith estimates, right? Or the equivalent of good faith estimates. They have, the lenders are, they're, they're doing, you know, the cost sheets for the buyers. The buyers know what their mortgage will be at a certain rate, at a certain price. So that's how they can determine what the per diem is that they're looking to charge the seller, okay? Or they can just put a, a flat fee. All right, any questions on that? No. Okay. Um, I'll show you how to close this. <clears throat> the next piece is the occupancy deadline. Okay. We cleaned this up a little bit as well. So, on the occupancy deadline, what it said previously was that if the seller vacated early before the occupancy deadline that the seller was still responsible for utilities and for the condition of the property through the occupancy deadline. Well, that gave me heartburn because I thought if a buyer moves in to the property early and is using the utilities, there's no reason the seller should be paying the utilities that the buyer is using, right? Gave me some heartburn. Same with condition. The seller no longer has access to the property. The buyers moved in. They, they have no way to know what the condition is. So we needed to um, update this a little bit, okay? So the first section, of course, has what the occupancy deadline is, 9 p.m., right, by whatever day. Please keep in mind, 60 days is your max. Okay, that is lender driven. <laughs> buyers at closing, for those that don't know, are signing an affidavit when it's an owner-occupied property that says that they plan to occupy as their primary residence within 60 days of closing. That is why 60 days is our limit. So if the seller is vacating before the deadline, the first choice is the buyer will or will not refund the unused part of the occupancy charge. So this is completely separate from utilities condition, what a possession, right? It simply is if they are vacating early, the buyer will or will not refund. There are some times that a buyer wants to give an incentive to the seller to get out early and they will say, yes, we'll give you your money back for the days that you don't use the property. In a lot of cases, a buyer has made arrangements for that full period of time and it costs them money. So they might say, yes, I would love for you to leave early, but I can't pay you back for your unused days because I've already had to pay something else, right? Like if they have rent or, you know, somewhere um, they paid for storage, whatever the case is, okay? So they will or will not refund any of the unused occupancy charge. If the seller vacates before the deadline, seller must give buyer three days written notice before vacating, okay? That's same as before. If the seller vacates before the deadline, the seller will remain responsible for property maintenance and condition and for paying the cost of utilities until deadline, okay? However, if the parties agree in writing that the buyer is going to take possession, exclusive possession when the seller vacates, right? So buyer is going to move in, okay? They're taking the keys away from the seller. Buyer says, it's my house now. Thank you very much. Then the buyer becomes responsible for maintenance and condition and for paying the cost of utilities from the date the seller vacates. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? That's correct. It is not, they are two separate items. Jeff asked, he clarified, this is not tied to the occupancy charge. Okay, they're two separate things. You can still keep their money for the occupancy charge, but say, you know what? It's okay, I'll take care of the utilities and condition you're, you're done, okay? Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? Uh, Does Shannon, it sound like a good change to you guys? Uh, Shannon, that's helpful, but in paragraph 2B, it still doesn't specify when the buyer is supposed to refund the unused part of the occupancy charge. Um. That's that's right. It doesn't. So in the property and condition paragraph, we talk about when when the notice has to be provided. 
um, this is between the buyers and the sellers, right? On, on what is going to happen. That list of deficiencies comes three days after. The, any discussion about money is generally gonna come at that point. And remember, this is between the buyers and the sellers. And I'll make a note that um, maybe, maybe we wanna add how many days they have to refund it. Um, so that's a good point. Shannon, I have one more. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So in a situation where the occupancy charge of flat fee is selected and a portion, the unused portion of that is being returned when the seller vacates early, what is the formula we apply to calculating the remaining balance? So, so there either. isn't one. There isn't one. If it's a flat fee, it doesn't matter how long they're there. So the box should be checked that says will not because there's there isn't a way necessarily to calculate that. Oh, so you you it wouldn't be acceptable to prorate it by the number of days, for example. So. I, I, supp I suppose you could, but that's not, it's, it says it's a flat fee for the time that they're there. Oh, gotcha. All right, thank you. Yeah. Buyer wanted to refund it uh, for whatever reason. I don't know. I want them to move out early. I'd be happy mm -hmm. to refund it. Mm -hmm. Like you just use like the standard lease where you just divide by, you know, you would, you, and, you would go back. If there's a reason that the buyer wants to incent the seller to leave early, then my suggestion is not to use the flat fee. Come up with a per diem amount. It doesn't have to be the PITF. It could be a random number. The buyer could say, I want $500 a day, or they want $25 a day, right? It doesn't matter. Um, but I would, go to the, I would go to the per diem and not use the flat fee. Okay. The default paragraph is still the same. So if the seller fails to vacate by the deadline, the seller will pay double the daily occupancy charge or blank. So if there is no daily occupancy charge, right? If it's a flat fee that's chosen, then you have to come up with a number in here into this paragraph. Okay, so just remember that. Or if you're doing free. Or, or if it's free, right. Well, free would be a flat fee of zero, right? You, yes. So you still have to come up with the daily charge. That's right. Okay. Here's another up, um, update that I think is very important. Um, this Security deposit is going to be held by the escrow agent, which is generally the settlement company. Okay. Remember, the, the security deposit is not supposed to be something that's going to be life altering to the seller if they don't get it back. And it's supposed to be enough to cover if there's damage to the property while the seller is living there and isn't taking care of it before they move out or damage during the move out. Okay, this is not supposed to be an earth shattering amount of money, right? The seller will deliver, I'm sorry, the buyer will deliver a list of deficiencies within three business days after the deadline, okay, to the seller and the escrow agent, not to the realtors, to the seller and the escrow agent, in three business days, and it's three business days because we don't require the title companies to work on the weekends like we do, okay? If they don't deliver, if the buyer does not do their walkthrough and deliver their list of deficiencies within those three business days, this is an update. The buyer has waived their claims to the security deposit, okay? So what this means is that the escrow agent will release the funds, okay? They will release the funds to the seller. There's a, uh, pay, a sentence here that says, if escrow agent does not receive the list of deficiencies within specified time, the parties irrevocably instruct the escrow agent to release the funds to the seller. So we no, no longer need an addendum. 
There was never an addendum. Okay. Because title because companies this is were not part of the contract. That we give them notice. Yeah, so some of the title companies have not attended any um, trainings on the updated forms. Most title companies have escrow agreements that are signed their own forms because they're holding the money. They have the buyers and sellers sign these escrow agreements at settlement. So anything that we put in writing isn't really relevant at that point, right? You can't, an addendum to a contract that's already completed is not enforceable. Right. And this is not part of the contract. This is an agreement. So you're not going to do an addendum to an agreement. Right. Um, what it said before was that the title company could release, the escrow agent could release. This is telling them to release it. Um, so, very important update. Say, I need something confirming it's the three days Three days go by, they don't have anything, and it's it's hey, it's done. Yes. We've in the past with post settlement occupancies where the the listing agent refuses to give us their uh buyer's information. Just wait, and... just wait. Okay. I'm reading your okay. mind. Just I'm wait. Like, Is there a box <laughs> now? Because we ran across yep. this a couple yep, of okay. just wait. Yep, okay. we're right there. But I know, I know, I know it's a big issue, and that so we've addressed it. So the notice paragraph is also an update, and it says, for the purposes of this agreement, buyer and seller acknowledge and agree that the listing brokerage and cooperating brokerage are removed from all communications or notices after settlement date. We really should have put this in bold, okay? Some of the chatter online that I have seen shows that this is shocking to some realtors that are out there, that they don't know that they're not supposed to be the keepers of the communication anymore during post-settlement. All of you know this already, though, because you have to listen to me regularly. There are a lot of agents that are out in the world that don't understand this, okay? So we put it very clearly. There is on page four, you'll see that there's a um, section for uh, contact information to be provided at some point before settlement. What this also states in this paragraph is that should the parties not provide contact information prior to settlement, that the escrow agent and or realtors can provide the contact information. Okay, it is giving us permission to do that because buyers and sellers talk to each other. Okay, so Delara, did I just make your day? Yes, because now I can refer people back to the contract. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Um, there was some discussion about putting in a line for delivery, right, in the document like we have in the contract. Um, and there was some pushback that some agents didn't want their clients' contact information to be readily available during the, the ratified contract period. I will tell you that um, I'm aware of this thing called Google. And if buyers and sellers wanna find out contact information for each other, they're gonna find it out regardless of whether we put it in the document. So that was not a concern for me, but we, we compromised and we put it on a separate page so that it doesn't make it look like the document has missing information and so then it wouldn't be enforceable. Okay, so it's on a separate page. Property maintenance and condition. This is another one. What happens when the refrigerator breaks during post-settlement occupancy? What happens? What does the seller have to do? Pay for it. Right. Uh -huh. Same condition as it was at settlement. Yep, Michelle, you unmuted. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I said pay for it. <laughs> yeah, so the, the theory, right, has been that the seller would replace the refrigerator, right, if it dies. Well, that's not exactly what the property maintenance and condition paragraph was instructing. It said substantially the same condition as of the date of closing. 
So if the refrigerator dies during the post-settlement occupancy because it hit the end of its useful life, there's two things. One is end of its useful life goes on the buyer because the buyer knew the age of the appliances, okay? The seller's responsibility, if this is a 10-year-old refrigerator, would be to replace that refrigerator that died with a 10-year-old refrigerator, okay? Not a brand new refrigerator because brand new is not substantially the same condition as of the date of settlement, okay? Um, it's very important for our clients to understand this, right? Sometimes there may be a credit that needs to be given from the seller to the buyer for depreciation value. If something was older and it breaks, but it's not the full amount, okay? So substantially the same condition does not mean brand new, okay? We've clarified also in fire flooding and casualty damage as a part of this that those items are the responsibility of the buyer, right? The buyer is taking on the, the, the big insurance, the big items. It's not the seller's fault if there's a huge windstorm that comes through and takes all the siding off, right? That has nothing to do with the seller. The buyer's insurance would have to take care of that. Home warranty. Why is there a home warranty paragraph in this document when there was already a home warranty discussed in the contract? Yeah, to clarify if there is one, how does it pertain to the post-settlement occupancy? Well, it pertains to post-settlement occupancy because we wanted to give an avenue for buyers and sellers to have a way to get things fixed during that post-settlement occupancy period where things did not fall under a pre-existing condition clause. Okay, most warranties, if there is seller coverage, which we specify here, that it must have seller coverage, they need to provide that so that there's no lapse in coverage. So then the home warranty company is not gonna say this is pre-existing because the theory is if it was broken before settlement, the seller would have used the warranty because the seller had coverage. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? So this is just another tool for them to be able to deliver the home in substantially the same condition. How much is a home warranty? Like 500 bucks, right? Adding seller coverage is free unless you need to add like, unless the seller adds HVAC and those types of things. So maybe it's another hundred dollars. Not generally earth shattering, especially when it conveys to the buyer for that whole year and it helps to ensure the maintenance and condition. Okay, any questions about that or comments? Sorry. Yeah, John, for the seller coverage yeah. piece? Yeah. yeah, so when there's seller coverage, it automatically goes into the buyer coverage. So because of the continuous coverage with that company, most home warranties will not say that it was a pre-existing condition. Like two days after closing, the HVAC breaks. So they're like, well, prove to me that it was working at closing when we write that it wasn't something that you were just holding over. But if you have seller coverage from the time at least of ratification, but you all know that I am teaching you to put seller coverage on from listing, then there's this continuation of the warranty policy. So they don't look at it as pre-existing because the policy was in place before closing. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so like there's no waiting period. Gotcha. In the um, fire flooding and casualty damage paragraph, we also added that um, if e either party requests a copy of the other party's insurance, the proof of insurance that it will be provided. Okay. Access to the property. We clarified here um, that the seller will permit by a reasonable access deliver one set of keys to the buyer at settlement and that the buyer or buyer's agent will or will not have the right to show prospective buyers and tenants, okay? So what does this mean? Well, this means maybe it was not an owner-occupied purchase, right? So it was an investor buy and the investor wants to rent it out. Um, so, or some situation, right, where they want to, 
flip it. I don't know, right? Um, they got somebody out of a distressed situation and then they're gonna resell it after they move out, whatever, whatever the case is, okay? Um, so this clarifies whether or not that's actually going to happen during that post-settlement occupancy period. I did request that we leave other terms in here. I, I don't like other terms anywhere else, but remember there's no addendum to this document because it is a standalone document. So I wanted to give a place for something, right? Very rarely is there something, but maybe it could be um, that the, the parties agree that the, the home will be professionally cleaned and you know so, something like that, right? Um, that could go here, but we're not rewriting everything completely. And then the last page is for the contact information. at or before settlement, right? And so that, so it will, it can go with the offer, but yes, yeah, right, exactly. So I personally didn't have a problem with it, right? I mean, like if, if it's in an HOA, our buyer's email addresses should be on the contract anyway in the delivery paragraph for HOA and condo docs. So it, anyway, we compromised. Okay, so that everybody could be happy. Oh yeah. I remember that. I do remember that. Yeah. 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 Alicia is reminding us that sometimes clients do that where they find our information, right? The other side of the transaction finds our information, wants to bypass their agent. Not a good idea. Okay. So how... How do we feel about the revisions on this document? This is a big Good. improvement. This is a big improvement. Having just gone through uh, a really nasty disagreement with the other agent on this on Wednesday, where I that I thought might torpedo their closing, this is this is helpful. Excellent, excellent. So this will be in your forms <laughs> libraries January first, automatically in DocuSign. Yes, Alan. Okay. Yes, and substantially the same condition is um somewhat of an ambiguous term however it's consistent with the contract because the contract states that at settlement the property must be delivered in substantially the same condition as of the date of offer date of home inspection or other which you should never be checking um and so that's we're, we're staying consistent with the, the the direction there so yes it's it's very important to set expectations that's right that's right. And so that's why acts of God and, you know, it, the end of its useful life, those types of things, that's the buyer's taking responsibility for that, not the seller. Other questions, comments, anything about this? So how do you go about uh, determining the, the actual value of a 10 year old refrigerator? Kind of Look it up online. Yeah, I mean, what's a new refrigerator divided by ten years? And okay, I mean, that, I mean that that would be the simple way that I would do it, right? Um, I I don't think it has to be made complicated, right? But I definitely think expectations have to be set clearly. <laughs> yeah, certain things can't be repaired, right? After a certain period of time, that's right. Yep, so setting expectations, huge. All right, awesome. So now we are going to go to the next heavy um, document. So we're gonna get all the heavy stuff out of the way early. And we're gonna talk about the lease. Okay, we'll switch gears to, 
to rentals and then we're going to come back to um, the financing contingencies. Okay, so let me see. Did this change for you guys at home to the lease? So many of you who don't have cameras on, I can't see you. Michelle, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Just because I'm teaching doesn't mean I don't want to see your faces because I check. <clears throat> so please, cameras on. Thank you. Um, the lease. Okay. So this, the lease was substantially rewritten also. Um, and we hit a couple of, so, okay. So the first thing we do is we reorganize. Right, so that certain things flowed together. Um, you know, the security deposit paragraph was like way off, far away from the rent paragraph, and you know there was some some other things in there. So we just we reorganized it so that we thought it would have a better flow um, for us, and uh, we clarified some things in a different format. So how many of you have ever had me send a note back saying that the rent? paragraph wasn't calculated properly or needed to be updated. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for um, understanding that it wasn't personal, right? And many of you have, have received love notes from me before in command, and I promise um, they are love notes. I do love you all. Um, the rent paragraph was substantially updated, okay? And so it's now going to be on a different page because it is very different. The lease term is still the same. That paragraph notices, notices. So we never actually had the contact information truly in there for everybody, right? It said, how are you going to deliver notices by mail, hand delivery, email, whatever. But we didn't actually have the true contact information for the landlords and tenants in the document. So guess what? You get that here in the document, all right? Because Unless you're a property manager, which none of you should be except Alan, you're not supposed to be the one getting calls after the lease goes into effect. Okay, landlords and tenants talk to each other, right? Okay, here is our beautiful new rent paragraph. Okay, I'll give you a moment to digest it for a second. Yes. Yes. I mean, just say that after the lease it could be assessed, mm -hmm. um, people within the lease can always be between the landlord and the tenant, right? Mm -hmm. But in case there is the uh, inspection, right, after the, you know, they have, the tenant has five days of the, uh, you know, say what is works and what's not, right? In, in that day for the inspection, normally it's the least an agent, right? No, and we're going to talk about the inspections in detail because that's a misconception of of what the process is. So I'm going to hit on that. Yep. Yep. Correct. Yep. So I'm going to hit on that. Okay. So what we did here was we broke it out into maybe an easier format for everyone to read. So we have the first full month's rent. Okay, how much is their monthly rent? Well, they're renting for $2,500 a month, okay? And then in this lease, it says, has it been received or when is it due? Because in most cases, we're expecting that first month's rent to be paid to the listing brokerage because that's what covers the commission, right? So in most cases, this will say has been received. All right. And then who is it given to? Was it given to the landlord? Was it given to the listing brokerage or just the managing agent, right? The property manager. The next section is for prorated rent. So this is for the number of days that they are in the property that's not a full month. Okay. So this is calculated as the full month's rent divided by 30. It doesn't matter how many days are in the month. It is the full month's rent divided by 30 multiplied by how many days they're in. Okay, so if they're in there for 21 days, you take the full month's rent divided by 30 and then multiply by 21. Okay, move in date counts as a day. Yes, Alan. So we've always, um, 
31. Yeah, so we're going to update that. And now we're going to do 30 days. Yep, the monthly rent divided by 30. Yep. And that's consistent with how banks do it. And so we're just we're just trying to to stay similar. Moving date is day one. Yes. Okay. So the lease term starts on whatever the move in date is, right? So if somebody's moving in on December 15th, right? The lease term starts December 15th. And if they're doing a full 12 months, right? Then it's going to expire at the end of uh, December of the following year. All right. So there's 12 full months plus the pro rate. Okay. So you can do total if you know, they were given, we're going to do it for 500, then you can do total instead of per Correct. So that way you can negotiate. Sure. Yeah, yeah, rent's negotiable. If, if we end up in a market at some point where um, where rentals aren't flying off the shelves like that, like the houses are doing, then yes, absolutely, there might be an incentive and it could just be a total. All right, monthly rent installments. Okay, this is reiterating the monthly rent. Okay, $2,500 a month. Is it due on the first day of the month? In most cases, yes, it's due on the first day of the month. Maybe there's something negotiated where our tenant says, I don't get paid until, you know, the sixth of every month. So um, there's, a, there's a difference here, but generally it's gonna be the first day of the month. And is it paid to the landlord directly or to the managing agent? So that would be the property management. Security deposit. Is it going to landlord or managing agent? Some of you have received love notes from me because the security deposit says KW United's holding it in the lease. And it has to be fixed like ASAP because KW United never is holding a security deposit, right? Because at the end of the lease, who's the tenant going to come back to asking for their money to be refunded? Well, they're going to come back to us because that's what the lease says. And then the landlord just got a bonus. Okay. Same with pet deposit. Or, or property manager. Yeah. Yeah. The there is no choice for listing brokerage. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Po positive feedback. And then get rid of that total rent. That can be mm -hmm. annual rent. Mm -hmm. People will put the bottom. We did get rid of the total rent. Um, I didn't mind having total rent in there. Um, but we, it was, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Security deposit. Okay, so we moved the information regarding the security deposit, not the amount, right? The amount's up top, but the explanation of what happens with the security deposit. So we moved this to be closer to where all the other funds are being talked about, right? Security deposit's important. So it's talking about how the landlord has 45 days from the termination of tenancy or when the tenant vacates to, to submit their list of deficiencies um, to the tenant, et cetera. This is all in line with the VRLTA laws. This is not something that you're generally a part of <laughs> unless you have been hired as the property manager, which none of you in the room are. That would be Alan, um, who's in the room right now. Um, if you're in Fredericksburg, it's gonna be Layla and Yuck that are handling that for you. The tenant will pay costs of repairs, right? It lists that, forwarding address, Tenant has to provide forwarding address, all of those things. It's it's the same, okay, as it was before, but I'm just sort of reminding. Management of the property. So is there a managing agent? Is there a property manager? Because they need the contact information of the property manager. If they're not being professionally managed and it's the landlord handling everything, then here is where rent gets paid. Okay, this is this is where we're specifying the rent. So here's also where you put all the information about written number, you know, bank information. Yeah, if they want a direct deposit, yes, then you would put that there. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So if it's if it's an ACH, bank information would go in the spare raft, along with contact information. Okay. Appointment of resident question. agent. Yes, you can ask. I, I'm I'm so sorry, Shannon. Back on the uh, that previous section where you fill in the managing agent piece. What about a scenario? And I've seen this a couple of times where the landlord is out of the area and has a friend essentially functioning as a manager, but they're not licensed. They don't have the business at all. I'm assuming we put the landlord's information in that paragraph. You would put, um, you could put in here the contact that they've given. That's not, it, so if it's not a professional manager, it would go down here in this section. And so if they want, you know, the next door neighbor to be the person who's contacted because they're overseas, then that's fine. That information can go here. Um, on page one, we have the direct contact information in that notice section for the landlord, but this would be another place to put additional, you know, direction if that's who they're supposed to call first. Okay, great. Now, any, anyone who's not a resident of Virginia has to have a non-resident, it has to have a resident agent, okay? And this is for purposes of being able to file court cases, right? This is not a manager or, you know, contact for maintenance and repairs. This is because VRLTA states that if you are not a resident of Virginia, you have to have someone in Virginia that can accept service of any legal documents for you because they have to be able to serve them in Virginia. Then they waive their right to be able to file any claims is what the law says. So it's very important that you have something written here, okay? Fire or casualty damage. So this is talking about who's responsible. This hasn't changed um, for the any damage that happens, whose insurance do you go through those types of things, okay? Occupants is the next addition. So if you remember from the July 1st rollout, we updated the, the application so that it had a, a clear space to list all the, the occupants. So this is another section where somebody can be added, right? If it's agreed to, oh, sorry, my mother-in-law needs to move in or, oh, my you know, son's not going back to college next you know, semester or whatever. And it wasn't on the initial application, but it's being agreed to after. Everybody can be listed on here. If this is not, filled in, so there's no occupants listed, the default is to what was disclosed on the application, okay? And that's what it says. All right. Yes, Veronica. Well, sometimes every application asks for who occupants are gonna be. Mm -hmm. So in case, let's say, it's the host of the tenant, they don't specify. Correct. That's correct. And that would be grounds for terminating a lease, right? Yes, John. So they need to submit the rental application, right? Yeah, the rental application has to be done first before the lease. Okay. Yep, yep. Because I was thinking like, since it's an additional, that they have to submit the application afterwards after the lease. Oh yeah, no, this, this says that it will incorporate everything that was listed on the application. Gotcha. Yep, okay. yep, good question. So, so Sherry's question is about, you know, the 18 year old son coming back from college. Um, the, the default answer is that anyone over the age of 18 should fill out an application because they should be on the lease, not listed as an occupant. There will be certain circumstances where a landlord would say, no, that's fine. Like maybe they're caring for an elderly, you know, parent or grandparent. There's no income. There's no anything, you know, they're the caregiver. There's, so they can't sign the lease, right? So they would be listed as the occupant. Uh, there may be a case where if, if the the 18 year old is home for a semester, you know, tr trying to figure out what they're going to do, you don't want them on lease. 
but you want them as an occupant. It's not correct. Correct. When when they're living with with a guardian, right? Okay. Correct. If they're below the age of eighteen, then yes, no, there's no application, but they're listed as an occupant. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't leave it blank and just default to what the what was on the application. I would always fill in everything I can just to make it clear that everybody's on the same page. Absolutely. Okay, move in inspection. So this is. Oh yes, L. Mm -hmm. Well, there has to be something in writing that authorizes them to be there. If it's more than the 14 days. Well, then they, that's a breach of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is about what happens if somebody stays for more than the 14 days? you know is comes for months and nothing's in writing that approved it then what do you do well the remedies to are listed in here in the lease on what what you do when you need to rectify a breach of contract right and that's a breach of contract and so a notice is sent to the um tenant saying that you've breached xyz term of the contract and you have you know 30 days to resolve it and if you don't then we then the contract lease right can be terminated Janet? Yes, Paul. Just out of curiosity, why, um, how come they, are they ever going to update that to the point where literally the, the people that are applying are the ones that should be putting down the background, each additional person that's living there? Because in the case, like you just mentioned, their kids are from, are in college. They're not contributing to, to the payment of the lease. We updated it on the application. So the application lists where they can put the where they put the occupants, ages, and those types of things. Okay. So, Shannon. Yes. So when my mom comes up from Louisiana for two months uh -huh. and stays in the states with us, yep. uh -huh. that means technically I'm in breach of contract. Yes. If you don't have something in writing from the landlord stating that you can have the additional occupant for that period of time. Interesting. So I broke my contract last summer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In writing can can be an email. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have to. It's not. It doesn't. It's not going to be a lease addendum where they come back to you and ask you. You know, if there's a property manager, then they're going to want to do a lease addendum, right? Because they're, you know, still in this phase with them. But you, as an agent, don't have to get involved and do a lease addendum. I suppose you can, but it's outside of your agency agreement responsibilities once they move in. So it can just be an email that says, yes, you have permission for, you know, your mom to stay for two months every year, um, you know, or every, you know, quarter or, you know, whatever it is, right, mm -hmm. um, to be there. And technically and legally, they could say no. So they could say my mom can't come stay with me for two months if they wanted to? Correct. Wow. That's really that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't okay. tell. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes, Alan. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yep. Kid home for college for the summer. Same situation. Landlord needs to know that there's an extra person living in the home, right? That's additional wear and tear. Um, may, maybe the additional people put you over the, um, the occupancy allowance for zoning for that property. Yes. Yes. All right. Move in inspection. Move in. This is the second most um, misunderstood topic in our lease, the move in inspection. So there are many agents in our world that are still operating um, in a time machine, 
Now, don't get me wrong. I, I love when well, my mom says that I'm in the way back machine because like I like to go way back to like when I was, you know, five or six. But anyway, um, they live in a time machine and they are operating under rules that don't exist. OK, and there used to be two different avenues for leases. One was the VRLTA and one was common law. And there used to be a choice and there would be certain triggers that if it used to be if they owned more than four properties, they had to go under VRLTA and then it changed to two. And now guess what? Everybody is under VRLTA. Everybody. A couple years ago. Yeah. Everybody is under VRLTA. That's why you don't have a choice for another lease. Right. And that's why I get heartburn when somebody says, oh, my seller wants to use their own lease. Oh, well, guess what? They can't if we're involved. Sorry. Um, well, we need, we have to disclose up front that they're, they're still bound by VRLTA laws, but if they want to use a different lease, then we have to disclose that up front and anything that's in conflict, VRLTA supersedes. And so there could be something written that there's an agreement about something like this might be, um, like late rent charges, right? Late rent fees are governed with a max from VRLTA of how much you can charge. But somebody might write in that there's different charges. Well, that's not, it doesn't matter what you agree to. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. So one of the big pieces that was, excuse me, a difference on the common law versus VRLTA is that common law put the responsibility on the tenant to do a walkthrough. And within five days of moving in, they had to provide a list of deficiencies, things that they wanted noted about the condition of the property and provide it back to the landlord. Well, VRLTA, which is what we've been operating under for years, is the opposite. The landlord is responsible to provide the condition to the tenant. And the tenant has five days from receipt of that condition law to say, yes, I agree, no, I don't. This response from the tenant is not a request for repairs. I want to be very clear. The document we made, I think is very clear. It is not a request for repairs. It is simply a documentation of the condition. Any requests for repairs have to be submitted separately. So what happens when the landlord doesn't provide this inspection? The best practice is to go ahead and give your tenants the move in and move out inspection form, which we have just created at the NVAR Standard Forms Committee for your use as of January 1st. And they can document it and send it so they're covered, okay? But really, we need to be providing our landlords with this document. And the landlords, not you as the agent, the landlord needs to be telling you what the condition is. Okay. It's the listing side. Needs to tell to his client, right? That needs to be done this form. Correct. Correct. It's the listing side, the listing agent that needs to let landlord yes the listing agent needs to set the expectations with the landlord and give them this this move in move out sheet that i have um, provided you today yeah. uh -huh. yes yes and to respond now you guys know that i asked for a copy of the walkthrough sheet in compliance right why do i ask for this does anybody know why i ask for this when it's not your responsibility to do the walkthrough <laughs> yeah, so this is this is a customer service piece, right? I want you to be checking in with your client, right? We're, they're not, I guess they're our customer, right, at that point, or hopefully future clients again, but we are in a relationship business, right? We are not trying to be transactional. We're somebody at closing, right? They close, we're like, hey, thanks for the money. See ya, right? That's not what we do, right? Same thing with rentals. Just because they move in, we still want to maintain a relationship with them. Okay, so if we can get a copy of this walkthrough sheet from them, 
then we have it in our files. So when the lease is coming to expire and they can't find it, you are the hero. Only for so don't you don't ask the listing agent you ask your client no the problem is yeah. they don't give any they, they don't give any they oh don't know. The right the, the know. listing agent doesn't know correct correct there are right there are a lot of agents out there that are not as trained as you and it is a frustration trust me Yeah, if the if your tenant does not receive this form, you can give your tenant the form to fill out so that it is memorialized what the condition is. I'm responsible because of the problem. Then I'm responsible to the side, to the landlord side. No, no. So how they can find it? Landlord and tenant communicate together. Nice. Right, you're just providing the document. Yes. Who's they? The landlord's, the landlord's realtor should not be doing the walk. So it's that, I mean, you could go with your clients, right? So again, this isn't like drop your client off and send them on, on their own, right? Um, this is helping to facilitate what their responsibilities are. So if you want to go with them to the house and say, okay, here's a clipboard, here's your piece of paper, you know, go mark through everything, you can do that. Absolutely. But you are not doing it on behalf of them unless you're the property manager. And then the and then the landlord has delegated those duties to the property management company and the property management company goes and does that and provides it. Okay. Um I just, I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page about this, right? We cannot force, I wish I could force everybody to come to my classes. Boy, life would be so easy. I probably would be out of a job if I did that, but that's okay. Um, as we're doing these updates, you're going to see more get on the same page, right? This is an opportunity for us to do some training from NVAR out to everybody, okay? Yes, Alan. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and it's not, again, it's not part of the buyer or the tenant agency responsibility to go to that move and walk through, right? You can go with them, but you're, when the lease is signed is actually when you're done, right? That's what our agency agreements say. That's yes. Okay, if it's an investment property, then hopefully they hired a property manager and the property manager is going to do it. If not, then then they need to have whoever their contact is that's going to be taking maintenance calls and those types of things through the walkthrough. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Somebody. Somebody, yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. All right, I have yapped for exactly one hour. Um, we have more to cover, but I'm going to take a, just a five minute break. Okay, the friends that came to see me in person get to go grab some food real quick if they want and come sit back down. Those of you at home can go to the bathroom um, or ask me questions. Um, I'll stay on here with you. So we'll just take a quick five minutes and come back at 1213. Yes, the um, conventional financing.
Oh, yeah, please do. And then I can pass. Yeah, of course. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sponsoring. All right, let me see if everybody has their. <clears throat> friends it is 12 12 let's come back get started in a minute we, we, we would be moving this to the bathroom if i had that many questions Yeah. Yeah. yeah, see, I would much rather have it in person. Of course. All right, it is 1213. Thank you for the five minute break. I, yes. The, uh, our friends here in Kingstown were treated to lunch by our sponsor, our wonderful sponsor, Melissa Landon from CMG Mortgage. So thank you, Melissa. We really appreciate that. And I certainly appreciate having everybody on Zoom and in person. I'm going to do this again on Tuesday in 
Falls Church from one to three. So eat before you come. Um, but we'll, was, we'll, we'll do an in-person one um, on Tuesday. Okay. I was treated to lunch by my sponsor, Mimi Como. Give me red beans and rice. What, did you just say Mimi was going to sponsor and make us food? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, utilities and service. We're gonna start with utilities and services. So the next two sections, we updated nothing that is rocket science here for you, but what we did was we changed this so that um, it's consistent with the way that our other documents look, right? Our agency agreements look like this, our contract looks like this. So why not make the lease look like this too? The other piece is that down here in fixtures and appliances, no one will receive love notes from me anymore for not typing out the appliances that are in the home. Because I get a variety of different things where it'll be blank, it'll say all installed, it'll say like a variety of different things. So now we've made it very easy to just check the box. If it's there, check the box, okay? And then you can put any as is appliances. As is appliances in a rental mean that the landlord is not responsible for repair and they're telling you that up front. Okay. Tenant maintenance obligations. This is the same. Yes, Veronica. And that ends up line. Let's say the degree is on line, right? Uh -huh. And as it is, so let's say broke. Uh -huh. So if the yes, if the tenant wants a refrigerator, then yes, and they're responsible. When they put the document, right? Let's say they have a homeowner, uh -huh. right? The landlord, and they need to be done. The mm -hmm. tenant's responsible for everything mm -hmm. on that appliance. That's why we really shouldn't be putting things there. As is appliances might would be like a lawnmower that's left for the for the tenant to use or correct. Yeah. It may, major appliances should never be listed in as is in a rental. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what would you want to to put in other that's not listed on here? I have some I have some places where they they have like a wall, like the back of the but I have one with that a few rarely see, but it's all there. Mm -hmm. No, there's not that many, but sometimes they have like a. Uh, a dishwasher that's not in, that's not filled in and that's like extra i think it move out of the way things like this so you would just put two for dishwasher in that case on the built-in microwave if it's just a countertop microwave just do a strike through on where it's <coughs> built in and just leave it as microwave have everybody initial yeah yeah there's going to be very few occasions where there's going to be something left that's not in that wouldn't I be have, looked at as as is condition i have one on here that so in my current place, um, the landlord left a, a treadmill. So where it's, and it's not as is, um, well, maybe it might be, I don't know, but but where would, how would they show that that's being left? That'd so be a it. treadmill would be personal property and that could be any personal property that's left could go on an addendum and whatever okay. the agreement is, right? Because if the, if the landlord left a treadmill, you want to know who's responsible if it breaks, right? Right, Is right, it exactly. as is? or not, I mean, most of the time that stuff you would want to be as is, but personal property should be listed on an addendum and it be very clear what the expectation is. Perfect, thank you. I think that obvious, right? There, when I was put sometimes when you were, what do we put in this case if it's the listed agent as well? Anything that you're adding goes on a, an addendum. Yep. yep. So 
I mean, it, that's not a best practice because if the washer and dryer break, then the tenant needs to buy their own new washer and dryer and then the tenant has to take it with them, right? Yeah, it's not a best practice for major utilities to be as its condition. If it's the only one, right? If there's like a second one, then maybe that you know, would be as is, like the refrigerator in the garage or something. <laughs> okay, this section on tenant maintenance has not changed. Statement of tenant rights and responsibilities. I've sent lots of love notes for leases that are missing this. This is the documents, that four page document, right? From the state. Landlord is to provide this to the tenant. It goes with the lease. Okay, so does landlord providing it to the tenant? All right, lead paint hasn't changed. My order consent required, we didn't change. Move out inspection, this paragraph changed. So if you see down the left-hand side, there are check boxes, okay? These check boxes are for what you are invoking into the lease that is a term that the parties have to comply with. So does the, um, Tenant have to have carpets, gutters, chimney professionally cleaned and provide copies of all receipts. If you are not having the gutters or chimneys cleaned by the tenants, strike it out. Okay, leave it as carpets, have everybody initial. Premises professionally treated for fleas and ticks if animals have been present. Well, if they're not supposed to have animals, then you don't need to check that box because they don't need to have it treated, right? Um, <clears throat> so these are things that are um, negotiable items, okay? We also added the landlord and tenant agree that the landlord will perform any cleaning and maintenance responsibilities not checked and that the landlord and tenant acknowledge and agree that the landlord will withhold blank from the security deposit for those cleaning services. So let's say the tenant up front is like, you know what, I know it's gonna be too hectic when I move out, I can't have the carpets cleaned, right? So you're not gonna, you won't check the box, right? It'll be left blank, but down here, it'll say that the tenant has agreed up front that they're gonna credit back from the security deposit, $300, right? For that cost of the carpet. Pets, smoking, all of this is the same, HOA, all of it's the same. Um, <clears throat> the, Early termination, I just want to hit on here. The tenant is not to be released from liability for rent or other charges unless the landlord agrees to it in writing. So there is no function for early termination just in general. Okay. It has to be a written agreement between buyers and sellers uh, or landlords and tenants. Otherwise, the tenant is responsible for the entire lease term. Okay. Is that a change? It's not a change. I just wanted to highlight it. Okay. Default and enforcement. This is this paragraph is changed, but but content hasn't changed. Um, we just reorganized and put things that have to do with default um, or breach of contract into one paragraph. Okay. So it says um, <clears throat> failure to pay rent. Right. That used to be closer to the rent paragraph. Late payments used to be closer to the rent paragraph. Um, so we put this all in one section. OK. Transfer of landlord and transfer of tenant. So there's only one one piece of this that updated, but I will just highlight for you that um, if the landlord resides outside of the area and they're being transferred back, they, it's transferred back for work and it's the same job that they had at the time they entered into the lease. That's what qualifies here. Um, transfer of tenant. What we did update in the uh, Service Member Civil Relief Act before we had listed out only um, armed forces, National Guard, um, you know, basically specific military type um, listed out. What we added was to clarify that employees of the Department of State also fall under this. So um, we just wrote that out. 
Okay, and then it gives the direction on what happens if they have to vacate early because they got orders that are 35 miles or more from the premises. Okay, or being sent TDY for more than three months. Tra uh, transfer of all other tenants. So this is the paragraph that says if the tenant is transferred by their employer that's listed on their lease or on the application, that there is a function for that, uh, for the lease to be terminated, okay? Um, just because they wanna go buy a house or you know whatever, they switch jobs, none of that applies to this paragraph. All right. Um, the only other, update on this document is in the attachment section. <coughs> Excuse me, we said um, we took off the box for the um, the EPA the lead based paint booklet, right? That was one of the choices. We took that out because the disclosure itself actually says they've received the copy of it. And so we felt that it was redundant to have it in here. If it um, needs a lead based paint disclosure, it's already stated on the disclosure that they received that booklet. We don't need to have it here. Okay, that's it on the lease. Questions, comments, concerns? All right, Veronica and then Alan. Uh, I think the tenant actually, uh, uh, the lease expired in 2051, right? Okay. And the uh, tenant decide to reach the property. Okay. For any reason, sure. Right? So, the tenant, the, we know that this title needs to be until December 31. But on the contract, <laughs> that the tenant can give a uh, notice 60 days prior, right? 60 days, he needs to send an agreement. Uh, I'm sorry, by written, um, uh, ask if they can, you know, uh, breach the contract before. And now it's the lender needs to decide if yes or no. So the 60 day notice, it, it does not have anything to do with breaching the contract. So if the tenant wants to vacate early for whatever reason, then it, it has to be negotiated what the terms are between the landlord and tenant. There is nothing set forth in here. Other, it's, it's negotiable between the landlord and tenant. There's nothing set forth in the, in the lease that says they have to give that a certain amount of notice to, to break the lease. But it's fine on the uh -huh. How many days the tenant has before? Like let's say... Can he live in November or he needs to live in uh, pay until the December 31? Well, if he leaves in November, then he has to pay until December 31. So, what this states in the lease term is that they will deliver notice to either party if they wish to extend the lease. Otherwise, the lease end date is the lease end date and they're moving out. But not like, okay, 60 days before you, you give the notice to the lender and say that you are leaving. Right. So you don't have 60 days before or 30 days before. No, you need to pay until December. You pay until December 31st, right? If that's what your lease goes to. That's right. Okay. Alan. I don't think there was other. There was other on the contract, others on the contract, but not the lease. Yeah, other terms, it's definitely removed. Um, okay, I'll I'll take a look at that. But it doesn't it doesn't matter that there's no other box if if something needs to be added, you add the lease to that. Yep. Yep. All right. Other questions on the lease? All right. Did everybody in the room get the move in move out sheet? Did Drew get that out to everybody yet? No. Okay. I think it might be on the Oh, is it right there? Okay. So the next one we're going to look at is the move in, move out sheet, just real quickly. So I can show you what we've created for you. So <clears throat> this document is listing all of the 
common uh, rooms in a home and items that would be looked at for your um, inspection, okay? What it's saying is this is a move in or move out inspection report. So you're not using the same document for both. The reason for that is the page just isn't big enough, right? You wouldn't have any room to write if we had a place for the move in section and then a place to write on the move out. So we have two different documents and, and you just have to compare them. And the reason that we decided to do that is the page, this is six pages already, okay? Um, <clears throat> the landlord requirement to provide this document and then the tenant to respond was more important to us than having move in and move out on the same sheet. All right, so what this asks for is, is it the move in or move out inspection made on, you know, whatever date pursuant to the lease? And then who's doing it? So move in, move out, inspection date, time of inspection, inspection to buy, right? So this should be your landlord or the property manager as the inspected by, okay? And then the landlord notes, if go in this left column, if left blank, it says the landlord notes no damage, okay? We needed a default for blanks, okay? Tenant notes, if left blank, tenant does not object to landlord notes, okay? So the landlord comes in and says, there's a scratch in the wood floor, you know, to the left of the front door. Tenant says, yep, there is, I agree, right? If they need to add something, they're adding it. So we have living room, bathrooms, kitchen, dining room, uh, bedrooms, exterior, basement. And then we have an other section if there's something else, you know, if they wanna mark um, garage or, you know, they could put garage here. We have a couple of sections for other in each of the rooms in case there's something else that needs to be added. Okay, this, would be signed by the landlord or managing agent and the tenants. Okay. Yes. You're just writing the damage. You're just writing any damage. Anything. Uh-huh that they want noted, right? So the landlord's saying, this is the condition. And then the tenant's going through and saying, well, I don't wanna be charged for this missing piece of the fence. So I'm gonna write down the missing piece of the fence. I'm gonna write down the things that I don't wanna be charged for at the end. Let's say it's discovery, right? And uh, we are there or the landlord's gonna sign it for, right? Because, and then the right, correct. They all there together in the meantime, they both be together, right? One yeah, they time. shouldn't do it together. Oh, okay, so let's say the landlord then, but basically the tenant will be removing by herself because the landlord is tenant by each by being this inspection door. report. The reason there's five days is because the tenant generally has to move in and see things before they see things, right? So they have a few days to actually discover things and note um the what the condition is. It's five days from when they receive this. Correct. Correct. Then the tenant visits the house mm -hmm. and has five days to see the He's going to write, he's going to write whatever's wrong. Yeah, the tenant's going to write. Well, that's why the, so the tenant's going to keep a copy of this and say, I, I told you that I think there's something wrong with the fence. It doesn't matter whether they agree there's, right? We'll take a picture. I mean, it, 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 if there if there ends up being an argument between the landlord and tenant, then the tenant should take a picture. I mean, like we have we we have to think that in most cases this is just this is um, people working together, right? Amicably. If there's if there's a dispute, then take a picture of the condition, right? And this is not about requests for repair. This is noting what the condition is, what they believe the condition is. So then, if there's an issue, it move out and they still want to argue, which you would hope not, right? Then then it goes to a judge. And the judge says, well, the tenant told you that they thought there was a problem with the fence. And, you know, 
to work it out. Yeah, I mean, that is a best practice. Taking pictures, you know, a tenant taking pictures of certain things that they want to make sure. Landlords too. Landlords should always be taking pictures. And sometimes the landlord have to see <laughs> Well, the landlord or their property manager should be, they have to see the house. That's how this gets provided. So mm -hmm. landlords have to step up the responsibility for owning a home. We're not slumlords. The, a property manager truly is a hired contractor. And so it doesn't matter whether they're their friend or not, that property manager is putting their business at risk if they're not writing things down that are appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's not true. There could be plenty of walls that have no damage when the tenant moves in. Anything that he wants to know. Yeah, and the tenant gets to write down anything they want to know. Okay. So, yes. Uh, typically, like for Hobain and Lugal, what, what order do these get put out in? Is it tenant first? Or? No, landlord has to do it first. Landlord has to provide it to the tenant per the VRLTA. So the landlord already has their. Correct. And then the tenant is saying, yes, I agree. No, I don't. Yep. And if they don't provide, if the landlord doesn't provide this document, you can provide it to your tenant. So that they have record of of everything and they've submitted it to protect themselves. Yes, and that's why that was my my comment about why I have the requirement for the walkthrough form on rentals is because I want you to be following up with your client after they move in and I want you to get a copy of it so you have it. So at move out, you're the hero when they can't find a copy, right? And you're providing this great customer service. So you're doing it's twofold, right? You're making sure that everything's going well, the lease was complied with, and you're helping to maintain the records for them. Okay. All right, we good on this document now? Anybody at home on Zoom have questions on this? Okay. Anybody happy that we've provided you something? Okay. Yes, awesome. All right. So many cameras off. Just so you know, I was checking. Okay. Um, next document and last document that we're going to talk about as far as a full document is the conventional financing and appraisal contingency addendum. So can you guys see that document now on my screen? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Conventional financing and appraisal addendum. All of you in the room should have it because I handed it out personally. Um, this changed a couple, couple of things changed in this. Um, I want to highlight that the contingencies where it shows that the buyer can void, right? By delivering the, um, the denial letter, we changed the verbiage to say that um, even though we thought it was clear, sometimes we have to make things clearer. We added the language that says the buyer may void the contract by delivering to the seller a lender rejection letter for specified finance. Okay, so we added the word specified finance because it wasn't clear apparently to some before that your contingency, even though it said it was tied to specified financing. We're putting it in here. Okay. Yes, Eddie. So, and in the meanwhile, the process that it's not available till the commission of the No, because that would kill the contract. So, Eddie's asking if during the the process of uh, applying for the loan, if they can't get conventional and then they have to go FHA, do you deliver the denial letter? And, and you wouldn't deliver the denial letter because then you're you're essentially uh, setting the motion in place to kill the deal, right? So what you would do if you're on the buyer's side, what you would do is an addendum, changing the specified financing to whatever it is, right, that you're changing it to, and then have the FHA addendum side. 
you're on the listing side, you don't want to give them the opportunity to have an out and get their EMD back, right? So you wouldn't do that. The only thing that a seller would sign in that case is the amendatory clause that's provided by the lender. Okay, so it's all it all depends on what side you're on. Now, if, now if a seller wants to be really nice and give them the contingency, because again, contingencies are all about what? Who knows? EMDs, love you guys. You can tell you've been in my class before. It's not about getting closer. All right, but we clarified that. Yes, John. So if they do change the finance, that means they're not protected by it. Correct. They they if they they can unilaterally change their financing and they no longer have the contingency. But in order for them to take the EMD, the basically the deal falls through the contingency. Correct. Okay. That's correct. For them to pursue it, right? Yeah. If they don't automatically get it. Yes. Just to be clear on that, so if they do the agenda with the specified finance and just take ten bits. That automatically adjusts. No, no. You need a new. You need a contingency uh, agenda. Okay. Also, you can't have one without the other. So because this, this would be a different. Correct. A different of correct. Yeah. Right. You need the addendum that that says the specified financing is changing to whatever, and then you add the financing contingency addendum that applies to whatever they're changing to. So if it's correct. Unless you have a new contingency agreed to, then the buyer has has waived their rights to um, an out if they get declined. That's right. What are you finance? That's that is when they change financing from anything that they disclosed up front. So if it's not what's on their specified financing, that is alternative financing, and they no longer have the contingency. And that also has to do with down payments, right? If they tell the buyer tells the seller, look, I'm applying for a conventional loan and I'm putting 50% down. And they're like, great, this is a solid loan. And then they go and apply for a loan and they're only putting 20% down or 10% down and they get declined. Well, it doesn't match. So that's not a lender let a lender rejection letter for the specified finance. Okay. That has to match. And that's and that's why it's very important that you do an addendum that changes the specified financing if you're trying to maintain that contingency for your client okay right so it so the only way out under the contingency is to get a rejection letter from the lender for the terms that were set forth in the contract when it was ratified. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's right. The down payment is part of the specified finance. That's right. That's right. All right. Our appraisal contingency has updated in all of the documents okay um in conventional you have to negotiate first before the deal can be killed okay usda fha va you don't have to negotiate first if the appraisal comes in low buyer can just kill the deal right that's their that's their right to do so but in conventional financing you have to negotiate first. You have to try to work it out. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. We have added language for the appraisal gap guarantee. Because while all of you were using the appropriate language that I had provided, not everyone in the world was using that. And so we decided to incorporate this into the contract. Now, a little, just a little note, when we're in the committee meetings, we're trying to update things to make it helpful to you as the agents. We're looking at, at adding things that are not only market specific for today. We're looking at adding things that are going to have longevity. And I can tell you that for my entire career, there have been times where the appraisal has been negotiated up front. Okay, there are still pockets that are getting multiple offers. There, there will still be a time for this. And so we decided to go ahead and put this in now while it was still fresh in everybody's mind so that we could make it work and it will be there for the long term. Okay, so what this says is that the contract 
is or is not contingent on the appraisal, right? It is, then you have the appraisal gap guarantee. And what it says is that the appraisal plus whatever they're agreeing to pay above the appraisal is, um, is equal to or greater than the sale price, you remove it, okay? So let's say the contract is for uh, 400,000 and they, the appraisal gap is 25,000 that they're gonna pay, okay? So that's 375. The appraisal comes in at 390, okay? That's when you, they have to remove the contingency, right? They can't ask for negotiation because it fell within that gap, okay? Um, this says the buyer elects to proceed without regard for the appraisal. So at some point they can deliver the notice, right? To, to be in line with that. Um, the appraisal language here has to do with um, the lender not liking the, um, the collateral, right? So even if it appraises within that window, the loan can still be denied because of something that the lender does not approve on the property itself. And then appraisal plus buyer gap guarantee is less than sale price. And buyer elects not to proceed without consummation of the contract unless seller elects to lower the sale price. Um, the new proposed sale price will not be lower than the appraised value plus the gap guarantee. Okay, so that's very important to understand is that if it appraises low, they still have they are still locked in to what they offered above the appraisal. Okay, so this is not this is a little different from how we were doing it before, right? Where if in our scenario, contract is four hundred. It's an appraisal gap guarantee of 25,000. If it appraised at 350, then all bets are off for the appraisal gap and you go back to the drawing board. This is actually putting skin in the game for the buyers where they're saying, I am going to pay this much. I've pre-negotiated and I'm going to pay this much. I'm not gonna ask you to reduce the price below, okay? Now that's consistent with our regular appraisal contingency that says you can't negotiate for a lower price below what the appraised value is. Okay, so if it appraises, you can't come back later and say, I want to renegotiate the price. Okay, so this in this scenario, if it appraised at 350 and the offer was 400 and the buyer said, I'm going to pay $25,000 difference, they have to submit a request for something between 375 and 400, right? At a minimum of that 25,000 that they said they would pay in the gap. Okay, was that? Clear as mud to everybody? Okay. Okay. So you're saying if the appraisal was 300, mm -hmm. and you, mm -hmm. you have a $25,000 gap. I can negotiate between that, within that $25,000 gap. So what, what I'm, what this says is that the buyer has agreed to pay above the appraised value, no matter what the appraised value comes in at, not to exceed the, the contract sale price. So if they, if it comes in at 350, they have to pay 375 no matter what, because they offered $25,000. Okay. But they can say to the seller, look, I can pay 30,000 above. So I want you to reduce it um, to 380 instead of 375. Right. So that so that they're not taking, you know, the seller's not taking as much of a hit. Right. They can do that. They can negotiate anywhere above what they promised to pay. But their promise to pay was a dollar amount above the appraised value, not to exceed that contract price. OK, does that make a little more sense? But basically, they cannot offer below the appraisal. They can't offer they cannot try to negotiate below the appraisal plus their guarantee. Yes. If it's at 300, yes. They're paying a minimum of 325, yes. Yep. Okay, buyer election period is the same. 
um, in here. Okay. The I only gave you the conventional financing addendum because the other changes are very minor on the others. It, it's the appraisal gap guarantee, but um, FHA, VA, USDA, we updated them all to say the lender rejection letter for specified financing. Okay, so I didn't need to give you the, all, the whole documents on those to see that, that one change. Uh, VA financing, we added, um, and you can look at this document, I'll add it to that folder in a little bit. Um, what we added there was clarification from back in June that the buyer can pay for their wood destroying insect inspection. So we clarified that language. We also added a link to um, the guidelines uh, for VA where it shows what can be paid. Okay. Um, the new home sales addendum was just updated with um, relevant changes in the in the main contract, which um, there weren't changes in the main contract. It was things that we needed to carry over into that. The new home sales addendum, you're not really using that much. Um, property management agreement, we have substantially updated. Again, this is not for you as agents. This is really for property managers, but the old agreement was very outdated. And so we changed it to look like our regular agency agreements. And Alan, I'll get a copy for you and Andrew to look at. Um, and it, 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 anyone who had seen the old agreement, it was like these blocks that just went down. And anyway, this looks like an agency agreement um, and is consistent with the RLTA. Okay, and you guys will get this document as well. And that's it. It's 12.50, time for questions. That document, you all should have, that document should have printed here. So we'll find it for you. Yep, okay. Questions? Nothing? Nobody has questions? Nobody at home? Well, that's because there's only five of you that I can see that are engaged right now everybody else has their cameras off you guys know that i really don't like the cameras off you can tell um so what give me a couple of ahas or oh, paul we're so in shock well show me your shocked face paul um tell me what your favorite change is or an aha from today i need three before you get to leave. Okay. Yep. The lease, the rent changes as a favorite. Excellent. Sure. Well, I wrote this down kind of late, so I don't know if I have it right. So I thought you said the seller signs an affidavit if they are occupying the property within 16 days of closing. Yeah, that's part. That's part of the loan package. Right. That they're telling the at settlement. So they're. They're signing saying, yes, this is going to be my primary residence. Okay. And it has to be within 60 days. And that's why post settlement occupancy is limited to 60 days. Now, what if it's not a low or it's mm. Okay, so Jeff's question is, what happens in a post settlement occupancy if they're not getting a loan? We don't want them to use post settlement occupancy. We want them to do a lease. It's a huge risk to a seller to be in a property for more than 60 days post-settlement when they have no rights under VRLTA. And it's no longer considered a holdover or short-term um, occupancy according to the VRLTA exclusions. So once you exceed the 60 days, it's VRLTA um, could very well apply even if they haven't signed a lease. And so that means that the parties are not um, on the same page. The other thing with post settlement occupancy that I um, should have mentioned is just a reminder that if there's a tenant in the property and the tenant is staying after closing, post settlement occupancy does not apply. The lease conveys with the property being sold. So the lease still applies. There's no post settlement occupancy agreement that you do if a tenant stays in. A sales addendum that just mentions lease transfer to the owner, does that satisfy that or 
it's the law satisfies it. So you don't have to put an addendum in place because the law, it's a lien on the property. And so by law, it can fix. But you certainly can put something. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. I need two more either ahas or your favorite change. Okay. Hey, Shannon, this is Ron. Yes. Are you pointing at somebody else? No, nope, you're good. There? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. No, and I, get them in the room. Great. Thank, for, first of all, thank you so much for going over the, this information. It's always extremely valuable to, to listen to you go over this stuff. You know, I when I think about the changes, I think of, about them more than just from a procedural perspective of the paperwork, but sometimes thinking about the ones that may have some strategic implication. And I was caught off guard, uh, not in a bad way. I was just caught off guard about the the added reference to specified financing and that change. And I was kind of chime in with a question that you eventually answered for somebody else asking, and that is, well, how do you define specified? Was it just a type of loan? But you also mentioned it for payment amount, as well as probably the, the interest rate. That are there, I know you don't like us to put the word market, you can put a number in there. So now I'm thinking, if I'm the seller's agent, that, that language seems like it makes it much easier for a buyer to back out of the contract because it's specified financing. You know, not talking about breaking the deal, but you know, they they can't fall, the seller can't claim, well, you can get a different type of loan perhaps and, and still get financing. So now on the seller side, it tells me my conversations with those lenders when I'm advising my listing clients on the offers to accept, they're really going to be very substantive. I want to make sure that lender can reassure me that that specified financing has a good chance to come through. Am I, am I kind of off center with that? Well, so what I, what I want to remind everybody is that's not, it's not a change. It's a clarification that we put in the document because the contingency itself on page one says that it's a contingency for specified financing, which is specified financing is defined on page one of the contract. So when we when we were looking at where confusion was coming, it just said lender rejection letter people were trying to twist it to say, well, it could be a rejection letter for anything, even though the contingency itself was very clear that the contingency was for specified financing. So that's, so there is no change to the practice that it is only to clarify uh, for the agents that were trying to find a loophole that didn't exist. Well, that's another good reason to have conversations. Thank you, yeah, Shannon. exactly. And it really, it doesn't hurt the, the sellers at all. It actually is more important for the buyers to have conversations with the buyers that say, listen, your contingency is related very specifically to what we put on this offer. So talk to your lender before we put this offer together. So it's it's actually more of a risk for the buyer. Than the seller. Um, all right, Eddie, you had an aha? Oh, yes. Yep, the pro prorated rent, the month divided by 30 times the number of days they're in. Excellent. All right. One more favorite form, favorite change, anything? I broke the law. I'm a lawbreaker. Yeah, yeah. The landlord-tenant discussion seems to be the a good topic. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now yep. understand why you would ask the <laughs> exactly the inspection. Now, yep. Now exactly. All right. So that's all I have for today. Um, Tuesday, one o'clock in Falls Church. If anybody wants to hang out with me again, um, I'll be there and I'll be here in Kingstown for a while if anybody needs me. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Oh, and no Ask the Broker next Friday because we have masterminds, regional masterminds um, is next week. And then we have a regional meeting. And so we have lots of stuff that the region is giving to us. So there will be no Ask the Broker next Friday. So you can see me twice today and Tuesday and not on Friday. All right. Have a great day, everybody.